Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to have you uh, back on board with us at the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates. Uh, it's good to be together uh, helping other business people for, with uh, giving all the mutual helpfulness that we can and working together and sharing information. So uh, it's good to be an entrepreneur. There's, uh, there's quite a few around, but, but uh, very few are as good as uh, you folks that are with me tonight because you're here to learn all about pricing and also beating the competition a little bit later. Uh, pricing, of course, is always a major challenge because it's always changing. We'll get it right one day and the next day there's something goes wrong, it seems like. So we're going to do all that. We've got three or four of you folks with us tonight. Glad to have you. Uh, my name is Steve Carver. I'm speaking with you from my home office studio in Dunn, North Carolina. It's over in the center of the state on Interstate 95. About uh, an hour and a half away from the coast and about four hours away from the mountains. So this is my presentation number 1070 and 46. Uh, clicking right along to get to 2000 as soon as we can. Thank you for being on my journey and, and let me be a part of yours. I'm not a lawyer or an accountant. Uh, I am basically a fellow that's been in business for 64 years, a lot of different types of businesses. And still very much in business today. I'm not retired. Matter of fact, my business has been a, a, a better uh, the last three or four weeks than it's been a number of years. So uh, uh, you can find me at workingcarrequipment.com where I sell tractor implements. I have tractors to folks all over the United States, and we've been doing it for over 60 years. So I do know what it is to be in business and work at it every day and work hard at it and take risks. But always the advice that I want to give you first is get a second or third and third opinion on really important questions before you jump in water over your head or, or, uh, or get in trouble. There's a lot of places that you can get good advice. I'll be glad to help you. Uh, and I know also that the small business centers across the state are good places to get good free advice for professionals uh, who will keep it confidential. So a lot of you are not uh, near our host tonight is at uh, James Front Community College over in Warsaw, Kenansville area. Uh, John Hardison is director there. But if you'd like uh, information about how to get in touch with and phone number or make an appointment with the uh, small business center closest to you, uh, just, just ask me in chat or drop me an email and I'll be glad to give you the information you need and even write a letter of introduction for you if that's what you'd like. John here, John Hardison, will be happy uh, to help you with your business. All you got to do is call him, set up an appointment, and chit-chat about him. But uh, he, he is a CPA, and right here at tax time, he might be someone you need to talk to. I'm coming off six weeks of <clears throat> dealing with COVID, so... My voice and my uh, 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 hearing is not as good as it has been, but it's getting better. So uh, forgive me if I have to get me some water from time to time to to, uh, to keep uh, uh, teaching here tonight. I got special congratulations to several of you who have attended uh, uh, the previous four of our five classes. Tonight is we're wrapping up a series of five classes. Several of you have already attended four, and I see you back with us tonight. So you'll be 100% attendance and definitely qualifying for a certificate. And I certainly uh, appreciate your efforts. <clears throat> uh, Edna, John, Amy, Sonia, and Tisha. And then we have uh, quite a few folks that uh, as of last week had attended three of our five classes. So if you're with us tonight, that'll be number four, and that'll qualify you for a certificate of two. All you needed to do was attend four of the five classes to get you a new and better certificate. So. Thank you all for uh, being a part of this and being with us. Uh, a week after next, we'll start off another round that will qualify for more certificates. I hadn't put that together yet. But um, Sarita uh, Sampson uh, is my virtual assistant who helps me with these type of issues. So after tonight, we'll ask Sarita to start creating some new certificates for us. And I'll be asking some of you for your mail mailing address Matter of fact, if you haven't given it to me and your name are on these lists, just go ahead and email me your uh, postal mailing address where the postman would bring up your mail to you. That's how we send out the certificates. 
come kind of, see we've got a busy calendar ahead of us. Uh, this through uh, August, and actually, just uh, since I did this slide, we've added some more. So I'll send you an email uh, that shows all of our uh, upcoming events. You're always welcome to attend them and uh, share uh, with your friends and neighbors and associates, and uh, they find it all the time as well. Uh, every new every session has something new in it. I change them every week. Uh, sometimes they're almost the same as the last one we gave them, but uh, I always at least change uh, one or two slides with information. But you'll see on this list, we've actually got some uh, some new uh, uh, topics all together. So I'm looking forward to sharing those with you um, as in the coming time. Tomorrow, if you're available from four to six. Uh, and and uh, you would like to use the Zoom platform uh, over in Nash County. We're going to be doing a, a 20 businesses you can start for $100 or less. I did the same uh, session a few weeks ago at, at a different time. So if you miss it or you want to come back and uh, and take this in again, it's a it's a fun it's a fun presentation. We talk about a lot of uh, things that you might not have thought about before on how you can get a business started for a small amount of money. And this is a good place to look for extra profit centers in your business as well. Something that you might want to add to the business you're doing now. So moving on with the nice lessons, we're going to be talking about pricing, of course. And pricing is never a black and white question because the very minute you think you've got everything just right, something's going to change. You know, do it every single time. There's always a change coming when it comes to to pricing, it's almost like you, it's a moving target. You just can't stay on top of it. And in these inflationary times, it's just really, really critical that you uh, stay on top of your business and get in the game. I, I do have a good appetite, and, and my, my waistline shows it, of course. Uh, but in one of the reasons I do is because I just love to eat, and especially I enjoy a great salad bar. Uh, I, I like to go get a little bit of this and a little bit of that, uh, mix up my dressings even, and put some cheese and ham and uh, lots of veggies and peppers and so whatever they got, I'll probably put it in that bowl and give it a try because I like the variety. And tonight's presentation, I'm going to be mentioning variety and options a lot because it is so important as uh, entrepreneurs, as we're making our pricing presentations to our customers, that we make them attractive and appealing and appetizing. And if you're just using the, the one type of, of uh, presenting your prices, then that can get boring. But if you're mixing up the different ways that you're pricing your services and your products, that will make them more attractive and more interesting to different people. Uh, what's that old saying? Different strokes for different folks. Well, in pricing, some people like certain uh, uh, strategies and other people like others. So keep this in mind as you're giving consideration to the presentations you're making. Are you putting up a good salad bar or not? Is it or whatever? Also, we want to think about not only the, the price of the products, but the type of the products and services. So I'm just going to use the word mix here. I don't spend a lot of time on it, but it, it is really important. Uh, in business, we can sell products and services that people want, or we can sell products and services that people need. That's right. And I want you to think about in your business, what are you offering that people want? And what are you offering that people need? Maybe you don't have anything that people need. All the, everything you've got, maybe something that somebody may or may not want from time to time. So that is the key thing, to help your business be more stable and be more attractive to different customers and to have customers come back to you more often time after time we really need to have some products and services that people really need. That's right. For example, I sell mowers. John mentioned he was mowing some grass today. I sell a lot of mowers all over the country to people who put behind their tractors and mow hay or ditch banks or hay fields or yards. But 
people sometimes really don't need the particular type of mower that I sell, but they just want it, and that's okay. So I don't try to sell them that because they want it, because I know that if they buy that particular product for, from me, in the near future, they will need some more blades to go for it. That's right. So as you're looking at the things that you're selling and offering to the, to the, to the public, challenge yourself to find uh, things that they want plus things that they need. So if you have a website and you have an ongoing business, maybe right now you're just offering things that people want for fun. They really don't need it. But if you can start putting in some items there that folks might need, like pencils and paper or, or, or information things or, or uh, uh, any items, tools, or things that might fit what you're doing that folks will need on a regular basis, then they are more apt to come back to see you on a regular basis to help you with your cash flow. Because whether it's want or need, what you and I got to have is cash flow. So think about that as you're looking at your product mix, and let's see if we can figure out a way to, to have a more substantial business with lots of customers that are coming back to get something that they need from our business. <clears throat> now, whether you like it or not, and like the, the sense of it, I've come to think and, 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 and be pretty solid in this, that one way or another, all prices are negotiable. Because pricing starts when you start buying, buying something to resale, uh, uh, you buy wholesale and sell at retail, or you start with raw materials and you have the options of what you're paying. So not only uh, are prices uh, not as solid as you may think they are, but from the start to the finish of the, of the process of putting a price on a product, negotiations are going to come into play. So I want you to know right now that forecasting and negotiating is super important to end up with the right price at the right time for your customers. So keep that in mind if you, and, and attend and read and uh, come, come to my seminars and other places and learn more about uh, forecasting and negotiating because at the bottom line, when it comes to pricing, that is very important. Now, some of you that have been uh, attending my classes uh, on and off for years now, and I appreciate you uh, staying with us, have heard me say this so many times, but, but Wendy and, and, and Roy and, and uh, 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 John and Maddie, here's something that is critically important when we're talking about our pricing. If you're just saying take it or leave it to your customer, this is the price, take it or leave it, then I want to assure you that a lot of customers, and maybe it's a huge major percentage of your customers, will leave it. They may come back, but they will leave it to keep shopping. If they don't think they're getting the very best deal they can possibly get, there's a good chance if you're saying take it or leave it, they're gone. What we want to learn to do is say, here is our advertised price, and here are some options of different ways that you can buy it at different prices. Because as long as they are still in the game with you negotiating or thinking about how they might be able to pay for it that will suit their budget, then you've taken them out of the market. And taking them out of the market means you've cut the knees out from underneath the competition. So pricing is a way not only to make sales, but pricing is a way that the strategies that we use in pricing our products help keep the customers with us and talking with us, not only to buy that individual, uh, that particular thing they came to shop for, but they, by, by uh, using take it or leave it, you might be able to encourage them to buy some other things with upsells and bundling so that you end up stacking your profits because you were smart about the way you approached your, your pricing strategies. Remember, we're all, you and I, just like the rest of our customers, are always looking for the best deal we can find. Uh, we, we don't look for it. We just want to keep them at your site to be there at the right time. So you want to set our, your prices high enough to make an ample margin, but you want to be able to discount it and negotiate. 
So this is a critical issue because especially new entrepreneurs, just getting in the game, new entrepreneurs haven't had the experience to understand, and I want to tell you right now, the most common mistake that you will make, the most common mistake that I made was pricing my products too low to begin with, thinking that I was needed to be like Walmart and be cheap, cheap, cheap to find a certain number of customers to do business with us. Well, th there's a lot to be said about that, but you're not going to stay in business by being the cheapest person in town. You will stay in business by having a pricing structure that gets people to talk with you, negotiate, and, and, and close a deal with it. So that's more than just being cheap, 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 and we'll get into that real strong. The way we get to where we want to be is to know that every price tag that you put on the service that you're going to offer or a product you're going to sell, we think with our DNA, now, now, now I'm moving into a point of, of my teaching here that I want you to have a, a, a game plan, a mindset, every time you approach pricing. And the mindset is build an advertised price tag. Know that you need to come up with a number that you're comfortable with putting out there, throwing out for bait, that you're comfortable in selling it at that price because you know that if they pay that price, you will make a really good margin and you also have room to negotiate or discount a little bit or, or, or to work a deal up with a customer. And even if you come off of that advertised price somewhat, you're still going to make the profits you plan that you needed to make. So it's easy for me to say I don't want you to give any discounts ever. Never ever, Roy and Danielle, do I want you to give a discount. But Tasha, the rest of the story is, I don't want you to give a discount that you didn't plan to give. Plan to give. Yeah, plan your discounts. Plan your negotiating in advance. This is forecast in the future, and you'll be able to make more sales and make a heck of a lot more profits as we go. Now, usually about half of my students that are uh, in, in my classes, about half of you, you're interested in selling products. And the other half, you're going to be selling time for money or services. Like when I asked uh, Wendy what she was going to be doing uh, over in Ash County, her short answer was retail. Well, generally when someone says retail, they generally, my mindset would say, uh, that's probably going to be selling products. But everyone has different terms, so I'm not sure of that. But whether you're selling products or services, if you've got employees, you're going to be paying those employees generally for time for money. So it, there's a mix of things that we need to talk about all of them. So I want to talk about uh, uh, trading time for money first and how to approach pricing that because it is maybe the most singular large mistake that folks that are, are doing this will make when you're first getting into business. We think that we have to, do, to, to put our price so I'm competitive. We have to put our price so it's attractive to people in the marketplace. Uh, we have to put our price for our services uh, so that I think I'll get a lot of business. But you know what? When we're talking about selling time for money, and, and, well, who is that? That's me selling time for these webinars. That's the person doing pressure washing. That's the person mowing grass. That's the lawyer, the accountant, the dentist. Uh, the, uh, that's folks who base their income on how many hours uh, per day that they can work and, and have billable time. You know, it's the artist who indeed is trying to sell the, 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 the pictures that they're painting, but you know what? They've got to base uh, how much they have to charge for that picture on how much time they put into it. So mastering the clock is all about selling time for money. And let's get into this a little bit because it's important with everyone. And I want to tell you, you're getting started that you want a business plan 
and you want to know how much you need to charge per hour or per appointment to meet your business plan. The mistake that some folks make is, well, I don't get into business and see how much I can make, and then I'll make a business plan to, to, to wrap around that. That is a mistake. So if you're getting into business and you're new at it and you haven't been doing it and you're going to be selling time for money, it's important that you have a business plan up front that helps you determine, one, what is your goals? What do you need to make your budget work? And then come up with a business plan to help you determine how much per hour or per day that you need to earn trading time for money. Now, you might be in business and work real hard, and maybe you are already doing this. And, Amy, you've already learned that I'm working all day, and I'm working real hard, and I'm putting 8 to 12, 15 hours a day in, but I'm not making much money. Then I have to tell you, as someone that's been there and done that, i got to ask you the hard question, how much of your time are you spending actually making money from the customer? Because training time and, and, and bookkeeping time and housekeeping and management time and biscuit time and going to lunch time, that's not making your money. And you may be putting in a lot of hours, but we have to determine how many hours are going to be billable. And then when we start making our plan around that, we don't have a chance to make a, 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 a business plan work for you. So let's just start and imagine now. Y'all just ride along here with me a little bit. Lean back and relax. By golly, there's no reason to get all stressed out here. Lean back and relax. If you've got a little paper and pencil that you can make notes on, that would be just wonderful uh, to do that. Uh, hey, Amanda, how are you doing? You got, a, uh, you got your paper and pencil out? Let's make some notes here as we do this. Let's say that your personal earnings, that you, wanna, you want to uh, have earnings of $1,000 a week. That's the number I just pulled out of the hair. Yours may be 2000 it may be 500 depending on what you're after. But we're together, working together here, Maddie, are going to use $1,000 as how much we want to end up with this week. Yep, on Friday, I'd like to have 1,000, uh, 10 greenbacks in my hand, 10 $100 bills, make me happy. But I know that what we're selling, we have, we're going to have to sell $2,500 worth of stuff or $2,500 worth of billable time to be able to have that $1,000 left over. Because we're going to have a cost of doing business. It's going to cost us about twelve seventy-five. dollars We're going to have taxes to pay about $204. We got insurance to kick out another seventy-one. dollars So I have to make $2,550 to end up with $1,000. So let's keep that in mind. Whether you're painting, whether you're preaching, whether you're uh, teaching or whatever, if you're selling time for money, you have to know what your cost is before you can come up with your goal. But your goal here was a thousand bucks. So let's kind of break this down now for hours. If we don't need to sell twenty five hundred and fifty dollars worth to end up with a thousand. That means that no matter how many hours we work, let's say you're going to work 40 hours uh, this week, but you're only going to be able to give 15 hours of time to actually work with the customer to, to do the selling, actually working to, to make money directly with your customer. And if that's the case, uh, you've got 15 hours you can spend, then here's what I'm going to tell you. You don't need to earn $170 per hour. Every hour that you schedule to work with a customer, you need to bring in 170 bucks if you're going to end up with that $2,550. If you're going to put 10 hours working, you got to earn $250 per hour and so forth on down the line. Like if you're going to, it's a part-time job and you're going to work 10 hours, but only three of it's with the customer, then that time with the customer's got to be worth $850 earning. Why? Why do I want to talk about this? It comes down to the hard, uh, where the rubber meets the asphalt, 
when you're when you're working time for money because you might be working so hard and putting in so many hours and driving so many miles and burning so much gasoline but not ending up with money at the end of the week or the month. Why? Because you didn't take into consideration how much per hour you needed to make to, to reach your goal. The good news here is I'm trying to encourage you to have a a, a, a business plan based on your personal income goal so that you can reach it. Because with a plan, you're going to have a chance to reach it, whether that number up there is $2,550 or $25,500. If you have a plan to get there, you don't have a chance to do it. But if you never set that goal, then you're never going to get a plan to get there. You're just kind of floating down the river and hoping that you're going to stay between the banks. If things come good, that's good. If things come bad, that's not so good. It's kind of like fishing without bait. You, chances are slim you're going to get what you want. But if you've got a goal set and then we've got a business plan to help you get there, then you've got a good chance of doing it. So the main tool when you're spending time for a meeting, of course, is the clock, but more importantly, the calendar. So if, if this is your plan and you've got a calendar, and I don't want you to put that 2023 calendar right in front of you tonight or tomorrow and look at the days on it. And then you're going to say to yourself, I need to make X amount of money at the end of this week. I don't do it on these particular days. And, and, and here, are the, here is my plan. And then with this plan, I'm going to start prospecting and marketing and going out and finding my suspects that are going to help me. When folks come to me and they want to start a business selling time for money, and they just don't say, well, I'm going to advertise, and people are going to call me, and, and, and when they call me, I'm going to go sell them and make some money. That's good, but that's pie-in-the-sky type business. The nitty-gritty of it when you're serious is you get your calendar out, and you're determined, you know that you've got to find people and spend those particular great hours that are available to start making money. And in front of that, we're going to have to do a certain amount of marketing and suspecting and going out chasing customers and asking for business to have that opportunity. It is not easy. We probably sell in time for money. We'll have to do some cold calls. And I get into this real deep with, with our business planning. So I want to encourage you to, uh, to attend the webinars that we're going to be having this summer and this fall. And we'll get into the nitty gritty, helping you get started in virtually whatever you're doing. And if you're at a certain point and trying to figure out how to get to the next level, congratulations. If you can't figure out how to do it, put it in writing your questions and talk with John or me, or uh, we'll try to help you start moving and, and motivate you and encourage you to get there. So you'll find it's real easy when you're selling time for money and you think about it in the light that I'm doing. You'll find that your next, that, you, that your most profitable next customer, where are they located? And this is the greatest gift I can give you as someone just getting started. Because your most profit is going to be made with the person who lives next door to who you're working with now. Or lives right around the corner. Or in the same office. Or in the same block where you're working. Or at the same school. Because what we do sell in time for money is you learn real quickly is you do not waste time and money traveling all over the world when your best potential customer is right next door to where you are right now. That's where these skills come in about forecasting and knocking on doors and, and self-confidence and how to do your best first impression comes in. And it is amazing. My best customer, I don't tell you right now, that I sold a, uh, a package of equipment to a fella in Utah this past week, the state of Utah. And here I am in North Carolina. And we're going to ship it to them tomorrow. And that equipment was probably worth, I think the check he sent me was something like $7,500. That included shipping. 
but I, he hasn't gotten it yet. But I know who my next best potential customer is right now. You know who it is? It is the neighbor of the fellow that I'm sending this stuff to in Utah. I don't know his name. I don't know his wife's name or exactly what he's going by. But I do know that if I satisfy this fella that I'm shipping the equipment to and stay with him and make him a raving fan customer, he will tell his neighbor about old Steve-O. And there's an excellent chance that neighbor, the next time he needs something, will, will be calling me. Remember this, your best customers are the people that are close to the ones that you already have or the ones that you're going to have tomorrow. Let that be in your mindset that that's where you're going to make your best money. Selling time for money, your business plan is to work four days a week, four weeks a month. In other words, you'll have a business plan that helps you make, meet your income goal by working 16 days. Now, it's important that you uh, adhere to this because you want to plan to make your money Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, four days. But maybe you're going to do this as a part-time job, and you, that, that doesn't fit you. So then you might say, well, I don't work four hours Monday night, four hours Tuesday night, four hours Thursday night. What I'm encouraging you to do is to make a commitment to yourself and to your business to be dedicated and work within a structured framework. Because that structured framework is a plan that you can um, hold yourself accountable for it and keep up with how it's working. Because it's going to look like not pretty to begin with. You don't know. you got to learn. you got to do it. But having that plan will make it work because that's what you'll do. Now, I want you to assign a dollar value based on your income goals, a dollar value to each day or to each segment of time that you're planning on working. And then you can keep up with, and you'll know how to start pricing yourself to begin with. So we know that if we're going to make that $2,550 a week, and we're going to do it in four days, that means every four to, every day we got to earn or bring in $640 for us to end up with that $1,000 at the end of the week. You hear that? Every day we got to bring in $640 to end up with $1,000 in our pocket at the end of the week. And so I know that depending on the type of customers I have, maybe on Monday I'm going to plan to bring in $700 with a certain type of business or customer I'm working with. But maybe, maybe to what you're doing, you can't earn but $250 per customer, or maybe it's $160 with each customer. Well, if your, if your income potential is $160 per customer, then I'm going to tell you that you better plan to meet with at least four customers per day or in a week for, with uh, 16 customers. To, and you, if you do that and you make those sales, well, I'm going to guarantee you right there that you're going to end up bringing in $2,550 and that $1,000 will be there for you. Anything less is not going to happen. That's where planning comes into play. Planning comes into play. So why did you say, Steve, why are you just work, working four days? I mean, there's seven days in a week. I know that. Been doing it for 63 years because when you're selling time for money, you're budgeting your time. And let's say that you're mowing grass or or, or uh uh, pressure washing, and you have a rainy week where then you can't stay on the schedule. So that gives you uh, uh, two more days a week to, to, to take up slack in case things went wrong. It gives you two more days a week to repair equipment. It gives you two more days a week to go out and call on and find new customers. That's right. Because this time that I've got on this calendar is making making money time. So if you're if you're so busy mowing the grass or pressure washing or teaching or doing dentist work or whatever you're doing, then that means you're not out uh, finding new customers or promoting your business or marketing. 
So the business plan has to include the time you're actually going to be bringing in money, but still give you time to grow your, develop your business, and very importantly here, to recharge your battery, to have a life, to do important things with your family, your children, your spouse, and just some downtime, or to grow a new business and start again. If you're a type A person of balancing, you're going to work six days a week probably anyway. And if you've got your plan made up to, to, to meet your income goals working four days a week, then you're really going to be making some big bucks and growing your business. So, but still, I'm encouraging you to plan time to charge your battery, stay healthy, have a life, have some time with your family, and go to church on Sunday. Now, here we go with a challenge question for each and every one of you. I've been doing a lot of talking here. I'm going to get me a drink of water here in a minute. And I'll ask you all to figure out a, a, a test. There's a little quiz for you. Now, on this deal, your income go after expenses is $1,200. $1,200, Lucy, you got that written down? Wendy, you got it? $1,200. bucks. i am going to tell you that your expenses per week or $600 a week. That's how much you're going to have to spend. Now, you're going to be doing this as a part-time job, or this is a new adventure that you're adding uh, to your uh, 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 life, and uh, you're, going to, you're going to be on this job only three days a week. But during these three days, you're going to put in 12 hours per day. Okay? So that's all the information I'm going to give you before I ask you the big question. How much per hour do you need to charge to end up with that $1,200 at the end of the week? Because you know that's what we have to do when we're selling time for money. To get that business, to get that contract, we, we have to ask someone. Uh, they're going to tell us how much per hour are you going to charge you. John, that was a good guess, but you need to keep figuring. That's not quite good. <clears throat> you know, we end up with 1200 bucks. It's going to cost you $600 a week. And you're only going to work three days, 12 hours per day. So how much per hour do you need to charge to make this come to work? This is a simple business plan. But as entrepreneurs, we need to be using this type of planning all the time. Every day, opportunities will come to you to make this work and go from there. Wendy, I believe that's right. I think you're about right. Uh, some of you on your chat board are putting the answers down. The rest of you can see them too, so uh, that's, that's pretty cool. So <clears throat> let me get a drink of water while y'all smoke it over. Some people say doing business is so hard and I need so much math and I didn't pass by uh, certain types of math in high school so I can't do this. Well, my friends, let me tell you, I didn't, I, it was all I could do to get past Algebra 1, much less Algebra 2. But this type of arithmetic, you can figure it out. All you need is a basic, I feel good about going for it. How much per hour? <clears throat> you want $1,200? You don't spend six hundred dollars. That means you got to earn eighteen hundred. Twelve hours per day times three days is thirty-six hours of work. Eighteen hundred dollars divided by thirty-six hours. Whoever said fifty dollars is right on the money. Right on the money. Several of you got fifty dollars on there. <laughs> it's not hard when you approach it this way. And you know what? Most business pricing things boil it down to once you kind of get a clear head, get that COVID brain out of your head, you can actually bring it down to some simple arithmetic and figure things out pretty darn easily. That's why when we're doing our business plan, I like to use the models. So that's that's, that's the way to go, everybody. $1,800 left 600, what's left 1,200. That's to put in your pocket and buy groceries with. All right, that is the basics of selling time for money. If you've got a particular situation, that may change a little bit. There's other things to consider. I know that. There's always a lot of variables that may come into play. 
So don't hesitate to put your problems down, put your arithmetic on it. And if you can't come up with something, then you, you talk with your director at the small business center, or you give old Steve over here an email and I'll help you figure it out. And if I don't know how to do it, I'm not no BS you. I'll just tell you that we need to find someone else that's smarter than I am. So we don't do that. Now let's talk about, let's talk about stuff. Let's talk about products. Well, let me tell you one fundamental law. If you don't buy it right, you can't sell it right. If you buy it at a price that's too high, then you're not going to be able to sell it in the marketplace and end up with some money. So you can't sell it right if you don't buy it right. Always is the case. So, uh, and, and, and buying it right don't mean walking up to someone that's saying take it or leave it and saying I'll take it. Buying right means to say, oh, let's negotiate and see how much better you can do on this price. Because we must buy below FMV <clears throat> so we can sell above FMV. Who knows what FMV is? It is the law in setting prices. Amanda says she knows what FMV is. That's right. Who else knows? Amanda gave me a hand sign. FMV, very important. We'll talk about it in a minute. For openers, let's talk about the three times rule. If you're buying something and you never sold it before, how in the world do you know what to put a price on? Well, I'll give you a little tip. If you use the three times rule, you're going to be somewhere close to safe. Somewhere close to safe. If you pay $30 for it, sell it for $90. If you pay $25 for it, sell it for $75. Because that will put you on the right road, because that will give you one-third of your money to cover your cost, your, whole, your wholesale cost. It will give you another third to cover your overhead, or what we call CODB, which is cost of doing business. And then there's another third of money left in the basket there for profit and taxes. So the three times rule helps you get in the game. But you can't stop there because there's other things to consider. You need to test that price against the market. So you need to do your homework, see, see what the market price on this particular item or service is, see what the competition is doing, and determine at that price or you, you don't be able to get a fair amount of market share. You see, as you're pricing, you can't be happy just selling one or two of something. You're going to need to be talking about the volume. How many, how many of these pieces of profit can you bring together? Because you need a substantial amount of money to, to keep your business running. And number three, after you do those first two steps, is to apply the market strategies, see what the fair market values are, what's going to cost you to advertise it, and then develop an advertised price for it. So the three times rule says whatever it costs you, multiply times three, then see how it fits in the market, and then check out the other variables, and then determine the final advertised price. Fair market value, this is the definition that you should follow. It's a definition that uh, you should remember and know like your own birthday if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You say entrepreneurship, if you're serious about it, a professional entrepreneur, there's some things that you know. And when you're a member of the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates, and you've been through uh, one of our uh, seven-week uh, programs, you will learn this and nothing to feel good about. Let's see how many we got here. One, two, three, four, five. I think there's five or six uh, on board right now that can probably turn this away and have some, uh, and go ahead and tell me what part of fair market value is. Because we've gone all over it that much, that's how important it is. Let's read it together. The price at which property would exchange hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller, neither one of them is under any pressure to buy or to sell, and both of them being reasonable in knowledge about the, the facts related to this and what generally the market prices are. The buyer and the seller, neither one of them under any pressure. And both of them knowing about the market and the product. 
And when those two individuals can come together and agree on the price of something, then that can be called fair market value. Now, who is it in our world whose main job all the time is to determine fair market value? Well, that vocation is called an appraiser. An appraiser. And there are all kinds of appraisers with different things that they're good at. Uh, the real estate appraisers play by kind of a different set of rules than the rest of the world, but pretty much everybody else plays by the same rules with fair market value, and that is exactly what we've got right here. What kind of makes real estate appraisers different is they have to use comps, comparable prices in neighborhoods, uh, in certain areas, certain times of the year. So they're, they're, they're a little bit more disciplined in a certain way of coming up with fair market value. But let me tell you, I'm a certified appraiser. I took an online course, got my uh, uh, certification, and you can do that too, and it's a darn good thing to do. So if you have an interest in appraising and the basics of that, first I've got a real good study guide I'll be glad to share with you and also to give you some tips on, on how to move forward with maybe becoming a certified appraiser on your own. It's really good to have those basic knowledge so that you can determine what fair market value is pretty much every time that you're pricing something. So let's take a look at this. Uh, in, in the world, there are a lot of different values. Uh, wholesale, uh, below wholesale, liquidation, a lot of values coming out. But there's only one value that's the law. There's only one value that's the law. And that is fair market value. Yeah. All these others are important to us because we'll use these. I want you to look at this long list that if you're buying something and you're negotiating, you might end up on any one product at any one of these different levels of pricing. And that's the beauty of business. That's the beauty of entrepreneurship because you know this and most people don't. And it's the little things that we know that make us better business people. Because you know that if you buy at fair market value, you're not going to be able to sell it above fair market value value very much, but it, your goal is to buy way below fair market value so you can buy above it. So looking at this chart here, this is as much, when you're buying, you don't want to pay any more than fair market value, and so you got to learn how to figure it out. And then each one of these levels coming all the way down is a lower price than fair market value. So if you're able to buy way down at the bottom, your profit potential really increases as you go up. Now, if you're selling, if you're selling, look here, fair market value is down here. So if you bought below fair market value, you've got the opportunity to sell at four or five, at least three or four different levels above fair market value. Hence, those are the areas where you're going to start making margins and profits. It's kind of cool. And when you understand how it works and you apply it to your particular trade or business, you'll start making better deals. You'll start buying lower and selling higher. The difference is in negotiating that if you understand how to negotiate, you can probably buy for 10 to 15 or 20 percent less. And if you understand how to negotiate, you'll be able to sell for 10 to 15% more. Hence, by learning these skills and these trades, your business range will range about from 15 to 30% more profit potential. That's a big lick. That's important, so take this stuff seriously. Now, once you understand and have purchased at fair market value or below, then it's time to come up with that advertised sale price. And that's number one here, the retail promotional advertised price. That's the big ticket. That's what, you, that's what you'll advertise at. And then you'll be able to start serious negotiating down to where you need to be uh, to make some profit. Or maybe you're able to, 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 to negotiate well enough to make the extra amount of profit that you'd be really proud of. is more than you had planned on. 
and that happens often. It really does. I've used this chart now for about four or five years because it's really effective. It represents buying an automobile somewhere in Greensboro, North Carolina. But I'll look for the dealership, they may have this used car that's selling for $13,875. And around the block, at a wholesale auction, that same model car, that same year model car, in generally good condition, may sell for as low as $4,000 at absolute option. That's right. And if that person around there that bought it at four thousand dollars and spent a little bit of money on it and maybe put it at his dealership and sell it for thirteen thousand eight hundred seventy five, he's got the home run. Made nine thousand bucks on that. He took some risk. He bought it he bought it for four thousand knowing that he was gonna to have to spend some money on it, but he also knew that the advertised price on it could be as high as 13000 Now, whether you're selling automobiles or shoes or hats or baseball bats or onions and potatoes, the same rules apply. It's about buying low and selling high and fair market value being somewhere there that is the balancing point. If you're playing volleyball, you got to knock it over the net, right? Well, that net in our game is fair market value. We want to buy below so we can sell above. And not knowing what we can sell it for sometimes, but if you know you're buying it below fair market value, you've got good confidence and you're taking much less risk than any other way you can do it. Fair market value, fair market value, fair market value. Learn it, know it, own it. Now, to the nitty-gritty of making all this conversation, put it in up to working for us, I'm going to show you how putting together a advertised tag price, a selling price, the advertised high dollar price, how you might go about it. And I'm going to use it as an example of the furniture industry because they, they have really good margins and do a lot of pricing. And these same rules apply to my business, tractor dealerships, car dealerships, uh, uh, anywhere to selling uh, items that people might walk in and look at a tag and kick the tires. Now this particular price is thirteen thousand eight seventy five on that tag, and the store owner came to my seminar that he knows all about this kind of stuff. So at his price tag, look here what he did over here thirteen thousand eight seventy five includes delivery, and that's our sale price, but it includes delivery. That's right. So, I, I'm interested in that, but you know what? I'm a salesman there, and you're a salesman there too. Uh, Matt, Matt, Maddie and Sonia work at this uh, store, and the sales manager taught them that on that same price, when you turn it over, it says 15%, you can save 15% in our sale today and actually buy this for 11799 plus tax. Mm-hmm. I mean, they went from thirteen eight seventy five to eleven seven ninety nine, right? Just like that. And you know what? When you go into a, a car dealership or a furniture store or a jewelry store, that's exactly what you say. They're going to tell you the high dollar price, but they're, they're going to say it's not take it or leave it. No, because we're we're ready to give you fifteen percent off because that's what fits that particular industry. Now here's. Here's the, here's the fine print. Here's what no one else would tell you that I'm glad to tell you, because that's what they pay me to do, is to tell you the things that uh, retailers don't tell folks. You hadn't been there, so you don't know it, so I'm going to share it with you. The most important words on this right here, on this tag, is not sale. It's not 13875 From the standpoint of negotiating, and keeping that customer there, and 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 while this says thirteen thousand eight seventy five, it does not say take it or leave it, because it's got bait. It's got bait there that says includes delivery. And those little two words are the bait to keep your customer there 
or for you to have a chance to talk to them because the next words that will come out of someone that's really serious is, well, what if I come and pick it up? Can you do a little better? So that includes delivery, but how far away are you going to do? Is that delivery here in town or is that delivery 10,000 miles from here? You see, that includes delivery, my friend, creates conversation. It creates negotiating and bargaining and working things out. It's the little things that make a difference in all types of businesses and in all types of doing things like this. Now, notice over here on this, on this tag, it said 15%. That's important. They've got an important price there. But the two most important symbols here are on this tag, plus tax. Plus tax, that's debate. Because that will encourage a shopper who's really wanting to negotiate and do better to say, you know, I might be able to pay that $11,799, but when you had 10% tax to that, that's $1,100. I don't know if I can do that. Let me ask you this, Steve-O. I gave you eleven seven ninety nine. Can, can you take that tax off? Mm. You see what I'm saying? Now, you're not obligated to take the tax off. As a matter of fact, you can use that to negotiate a little bit if you want, maybe a, a few dollars or all of it. I don't know, I don't know how, you plan, uh, how you planned your, uh, your, your process, but the plus tax encourages the customer to talk to you. Or if they're not talking, it encourages you, the salesperson, to have something to talk about. Well, you can bring it up. So you might be able to say, Look, this is a great price. I mean, we're already almost $2,000, we're already over $2,000 off the price here. But, but maybe I can work on that tax a little bit, especially if you could, do, could come and pick it up. This is where I'm coming at for you, friends. The little extra words there to encourage talking and negotiating make all the difference in the world. Now, I always work with my salespeople. I give them a third tag. It's usually out there by itself. It don't, it don't look like it has anything to do that the customer might want to see. But I'll tell my salespeople right there while they're standing at it that the low dollar retail on this item is 11250 that's the low dollar retail. But if you can't get that, and you can get them to pay you low dollar cash, $11,000, sell the sucker. Because these salespeople are going to make more commission based on how much profit they make. So you always want to encourage yourself or the people working for you to go for the big ticket, but you've got to give them incentives. If they make more for your company, they need to make more in their in their paycheck. If they are if they are a great salesperson, then they'll stay with you because they're going to make a lot more money than just someone that's there to come take a handout from you. So that you've got to give your people the ammunition and the power and the information to close sales, and then we need to teach them how. So this is a great example of the prices are there, but they are so far away from take it or leave it, it's like a different world. Okay, I, I hope this helps you. I hope it makes a major, major difference for you. So we have to build up that price. We have to build up that price. So let's look at what, where, what's the ingredients to build up the cost plus basis. It is with the cost plus this is the pricing is what we're going to do. The other one sell tax. Number one, we want our, our bottom dollar. We know what it costs us. We know what our hot overhead is. We, we got to, to cover our raw cost. Our overhead make makes make some money. Whatever you determine your margin is got to be. And this would be my very let's say profit center for uh, that you're going to use to. Uh, to bring in new customers or one to repeat customers or big ticket items, you determine in that profit you got to have goes into that net cost. And the next is what is the bare bones price that you'll sell it at to get that? So you got to know your cost, 
and add your bare bones profit to it. Your next your next level at negotiating will be I can discount it uh, down to this point. That's it. I would really like to stay up here at a little better margin. And, and then the top price under will advertise of that is the advertised sale price. So as I'm negotiating and talking with my customer, I know that I've got one, two, three areas, three different prices that I can come down to to close the deal, provided that they're doing what's required on the other side of the bargain. But all this has been determined in advance. You knew up front the very minute you put that couch or that car on the lot or that product, you knew exactly what the advertised price would be, and you already had your negotiating levels set. So let's look at now the reality. That cost that you're working at, that probably costs that furniture store $8,000. And then that's the invoice they pay the manufacturer. And then they, maybe they paid $450 freight. They put it together. It cost them $180 to put this stuff together. They're adding in their cost of doing business, a 5% kicker for cost of doing business. And they're spending a lot of money on advertising. They put, they're going to spend $520 advertising on that. And they're going to make at least 15%, $1,450. So that's how they came up with the $11,000. And as you're figuring your cost on items that you're going to sell, I want you to do the same thing. Figure each ingredient that goes into it. Now, this is exactly when we do our business plan work. This is a business model. I mean, this is a profit center model. This particular furniture item uh, this is what would, would plug into your business plan for items like this. So you will know that if you sell, if, if you sell 10 of these uh, ensembles in a month, you're going to make $14,500. That's right. Because you knew, uh, you know in advance what your margin to be, and you then can plan how many you got to sell. That's going to tell you how much advertising you need to do, how much floor space you got to have. It just gives you a world of information. When you do this, you're able to put together a business plan pretty easily. And then we go right up to determine the prices as we negotiate up to that 13875 Now, I know I went through this kind of quickly, but it's just basically bare bone numbers. So these numbers are in your handout and they will be in the slide presentation. So give it some serious thought. If you're pricing products and you're trying to figure this out, uh, apply these types of logic to your numbers. Show me, if, if, if you, show me some examples there and we're sure try to try to help you with it. So what we're not doing is take it or leave it. We want to give the customer options to stand here and let's talk about it a little bit. So the different strategies that you would use, the different strategies that we will use when we're putting our pricing out there is getting right back to the salad bar. Getting right back to the salad bar. Generally, we'll come up with a this type of cost plus formula that we've just worked through with all the strategies, but the way you present it to the customer, that's where we come into the salad bar. But you really got to know where you stand with your cost and your plan uh, profit margins so you'll know how much negotiating room that you have. So the sample formula, uh, cost plus pricing, is exactly what we just went through. The next type of pricing that some customers will, I mean, some businesses will use after they figure out the other stuff is and to keep it simple, because if, you, if you're selling a lot of variety of stuff uh, and, and, it's, and you'll spend a lot of time doing that strategizing like I was doing, but the things that I sell are big ticket items that I pretty much have to do it. But if you're selling uh, regular retail uh, stuff like baked goods or, or gifts or, or, or certain items, jewelry, then a lot of stores that, that sell the same type of product throughout the store, and they know their margins, they've been in business while they got it locked down, they will simply use keystone pricing, which is to double the cost on everything. 
in other words, they're buying stuff from someone else and they've got an invoice that comes in and maybe their deal with these other people is uh, you pay the freight, you set it up. So when I, when you, when I get it and I pay for it, it's ready to sell. It's ready to sell to the customer. And the keystone pricing just says, if it costs me a hundred dollars, the price tag on it's going to be one ninety nine ninety five. <laughs> I didn't say it's going to be two hundred dollars, did I? But if it costs me a hundred dollars, it's going to be real close to two hundred dollars, doubling everything. And why that's not called a hundred percent markup, I don't know. But in the real world of business, they call that a fifty percent markup when you double the price. MSRP is manufacturer suggested retail. You may be a dealer or an agent for an appliance company or an automobile or a tractor company or a weed eater type thing, and the manufacturers will set a worldwide price on this particular model number, and that's called manufacturer suggested retail because the manufacturers won't, don't want the value of their products to go down anywhere. They want to hold the price up uh, uh, because they're, they're going to be spending a certain amount of national money to, to, to be advertising for you. And so they will use MSRP. But most of us in rural retail stores in, in rural areas of America will take that manufacturer's resale price, MSRP, and we will uh, play with that a little bit. We'll add dealer setup, we'll add uh, freight, we'll add cleanup, delivery. Sometimes you can take MSRP and move it even up even higher to help meet your goals uh, when you're doing that. Another pricing strategy for that salad bar is if you buy one, it's this price. But if you buy three, you get a better price. Or if you buy four, I'll give you one. It's called bundling. Multiple pricing is powerful way of marketing. And you know what? It turns on some people. Some folks just love it if they feel like they're getting a bundle, they're getting a, a deal. So as you're pricing items in this part of your store, at this thing on your website, it's a good idea remembering the salad bar offer a variety of pricing. Uh, different pricing strategies tend to click, uh, turn on other different types of customers. So I like to use different strategies all across uh, the spectrum of what I'm doing. Everybody wants a discount, and you have to. Sometimes you have to tell them that you're giving a discount. Maybe coupons or rebates or seasonal promotional things that you're doing. But discounting is a major part of retailing, and discounting is a major part of getting that customer to say, "Well, this isn't take it or leave it," because the, the take it or leave it price was fifteen thousand dollars. But let me tell you, we're offering it to you today for thirteen thousand five hundred but you have to tell them that you're discounting. You just can't take for granted that they see the price, the retail, and they see the other price, but seeing the word discount is important. Seeing the word discount is important rather than just the numbers. You have to plant those seeds in their minds to get them appreciating your salad bar. There's a thing called loss lead, loss leading prices. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to offer things at a, at a loss of, you're going to lose money on something that will help lead people into your store. Loss leading prices is when you discount something really down low that wipes out the competitors. Uh, maybe you lose a little bit of money on it, but usually you'll be down to just above your, uh, above your cost. Because your objective when you're loss leading is to bring in customers. It's profit center type number one when we talk about it in, in our uh, business plan. We'll use items really low price to bring the customers into the store so while they're there, you can sell them other stuff. While they're there, you can use merchandising skills to sell them other items where you make a lot of money on. or you might bring in loss leading uh, as you're doing a bait and switch. Now, John, I don't mention, and I really appreciate you uh, mentioning a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in the negotiating uh, class that we had, that some of that stuff sounded kind of wrong or un unethical. 
Well, I understand where that comes from, and indeed, you can paint it with that brush. I won't argue with you. But the truth of the matter is, uh, there are a lot of different negotiating and, and uh, selling strategies that customers want, customers expect, and competition is, is into it. And if you're doing it, if you're doing a, a bait and switch uh, in such a way that uh, it's taking advantage of or being crooked, then slap your hands. But loss leading and bait and switch is a way to bring customers into the store. And if they're shopping, I want them in my store, and they can buy that. They can buy that lesser uh, cost item, but I want to have right there a nicer item that they can pay a little bit more for and sell them that too if they don't like the lost leader that I'm offering. So it's a matter of giving them options and just not saying take it or leave it. Lost leading is a great pricing strategy and it makes your, uh, your salad bar look more attractive if you've got some really good looking discounts up there. Psychological pricing is it is amazing to me how powerful it is because people will pay, people will buy 15 of something at 99.99 while they're turning their nose up at something that's a hundred dollars. Just a human nature about it. So we have to take advantage of that human nature. Now, sometimes the psychological thing is say, if I can buy this thing for $195 a month, that fits my budget. I can't afford something over $200 a month, but $195 per month, man, I'm ready to buy it. And when you learn to put your pricing out there that way, you'll start seeing your sales go up. And it's really kind of mind-boggling sometimes just how much difference it makes. Getting just under that plateau of certain numbers is really, really important. Now here's one of my price uh, uh, sheets or my web pages, uh, RolfCarterHoman.com. If you think I'm telling you one thing and doing something different in my kitchen, no, no, no. Here's the way I price my product. Look at all the 99s and the 49s out there. I believe in it. My customers believe in it. I never get a complaint or someone saying, I like that 99 state. But I get a lot of people that will say, that you did say that was not a 99, right? They almost never say, there was that 9600 state. They remember those 99s. And in my mind, I'm thinking it's one of the reasons they called me is, and didn't call someone that had exactly the same thing price for $10,000. I think it's that powerful. But it's just as important that you mix up. On the next page, I may be seeing for sale at this or a discount for that. So mix up the different strategies. On this particular page, I'm going with the psychological. Some of us sell things uh, or are just getting started in business and the competition is really strong and everybody's talking about it and you need an advertising point. You need something to really focus on telling your customers so sometimes you just need to be below competition. And you might say, the John Deere model here, exactly like this, equipped the same way, costs $1,500 more than what I'm offering you, or $5 more. But bringing the competition a name out or a picture of what they're doing is really important. <clears throat> now, web paging and emailing, you may not want to call them by name, but you can put a picture there. You can put a picture of the product or something that indicates what it is. Subtle, and that's called that's called uh, guerrilla marketing, is putting those images out there so you're getting your, your, your message there. So if you want to attack the competition, be careful about it, but it is a good mix of thing to do. It's like walking past that salad bar, and there's, a, a, there, there's an item right here that says, hey, these peppers, these, these peppers anywhere else, would be costing you ten dollars a piece, but right here you can get it for eight dollars. Beating the competition, making someone feel like they're working for that extra money. So let me ask each one of you right now, and those a lot of you are really doing great with chat tonight, and I appreciate that. Let me ask you right now: if you've got a, an item and you, you're figuring out your advertised sale price, now that's, that's what we're after. Now you're figuring out your advertised sale price. And this item that you've got has coming in cost you 
or your your price that you figured it up is is uh, uh, let's say that it's one hundred and eighty nine dollars. By, by, by going the normal rules that we've talked about, you figured up your advertised sale price, and it needs to be one hundred and eighty nine dollars. And I've told you that, but I. But now I want to ask you, instead of you putting 189 on that advertised sale price, what price would you put? Now that we're talking about we don't want to say take it or leave it, and we want to offer a variety of pricing, tell me right now in chat, is it 189 that you're going to price it at, or is it one of these other numbers here? Which one would it be? Wendy's right on the money. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to make something on chat? Wendy's exactly right. I would recommend that you price it at $199.95. I wouldn't price it at $204. I wouldn't price it at $189. I'd always go for that $199.95. And let me tell you, People will say, well, people will see that and just see that you're using that as a pricing strategy, and you are. And you're admitting it, and you're proud of it. You're not pretending to be anything but retailing the hell out of it. Because that's what the people want to pay, $199.95 or $199.99. That would be just as good a choice. And you're not going to disappoint your customer. You're going to send a message to them that you are a smart, accomplished entrepreneur who knows how to price your stuff to attract people to buy it. And those subtle messages sometimes are critical between you getting the deal and your competitor getting the deal. Things, things just don't always make sense. But I can tell you this works. And what am I basing that on? Personal experience personal observation. Sometimes you want a price uh, in your uh, salad bar. Sometimes you just want to be above the competition. Sometimes you want to be the highest guy in town because there is a certain group of people out here in this world, my friend, who want to pay the big price. God bless them. We need them. Some people want to pay the big price. They want to buy a present that people know costs a lot of money. They, they go to Starbucks, they go to Dunkin' Donuts, they buy Cadillacs, they buy Lexuses and Lincolns. Some folks want to buy the expensive stuff. And my friend, the good news to us as entrepreneurs, God bless them, because we want to mark our stuff up as high as the competition to stand. That's right. And sometimes <clears throat> you want to mark it up high enough, like one model will mark it up higher than you ever expect someone to pay for it. And then right under it, we'll advertise another one that's almost just like it at a, at, a, at a reduced price, but still one with a great margin for you. And people will jump right on that second one and pay more for it than they would if you had marked it down at a regular price because you offered it at a, at a light to, to uh, show how it compares to the competition. That's, that's cool marketing. That's just great on the salad bar. <clears throat> anchor pricing is psychological pricing. And anchor pricing is simply saying, here's a retail price. You can save X amount of money and pay this for it. But the key word here is, <clears throat> the key word on this tag is save. Because that turns on a certain percentage of shoppers. The word save. Bundle, discounted, plus tax, includes delivery, save. Now, when you go to some food stores and some retailers, when you check out, <clears throat> the clerk there is part of their part of their ritual is to say, "Okay, here's your bill. Look here, you saved two hundred dollars here today." Or you save thirty dollars here today. <clears throat> They're reminding you that you saved. 
even though you just took all your money out of your pocketbook, that person standing there telling you how much you saved. Why? The salad bar. That turns some people on. Some folks, some folks like a, uh, Sarita would probably say, oh, man, I saved $50. I don't go back in there and spend another $50. Or, wow, I, I, I don't get me something else here. I'll be back from it. Save me 50 bucks. Some folks just think when they have saved money, they still got it and they need to spend it. That is so, so important. So think about that would be some of the things that you do as you're adding in. Now, skimming or maximizing your profits is a very prevalent thing that we see. In other words, they price it above market uh, levels, way above retail reasons because they can get it. Whatever the market is stand is what I'm going to put the price on it. Who's, who does that better than anybody else? Apple, cell phones. When that new model comes out, it's going to be sky high. But as the demand goes down, <clears throat> excuse me, they start reducing the price. And they love it, and they make tons of money doing it, because if you've got a product you can do that with it, go for it. A uh, very effective marketing scheme. But remember, take it or leave it sends customers away. Let's talk about the competition a little bit now because it always kind of plays into play. The competition is important. may not be the most important thing going on, but we always got to think about it, and we always got to think about whether we're going to try to beat that competition or not. I hate losing. I, I, I love playing sports. I was played football and wrestling in, in high school and enjoyed playing tennis when I was able to do it. And I just love uh, competition. And I don't like to lose. I don't go crazy about it. But it's not in my nature to like losing. But in business, in doing deals, I can't play tennis anymore. No, not much of a swimmer anymore or a hiker. But I can do a deal and I'll hold on with, uh, 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 up against any competitor that's in my game because I know stuff that they don't know. And after you attend our classes, you're going to know stuff they don't know either and be able to be a better competitor. But you know, it's not those people out there at the other stores or other website that's my toughest competition. No. No, it's not the people down the street that's selling the same thing for less money. That's not my toughest competition. And you know what? In your life, it's not going to be your competition either. The competition that keeps us from, from reaching the, the heights and levels in business that we can get is the competition within ourselves. It's the competition where we're dealing with every day it's dealing with us. It, it rages in us. It creates lots of struggles and it's distractions. The distractions in our life keep us from moving forward with a lot of things, including small business. And the distractions aren't things that I don't say are bad things. It's just what we have to deal with as individuals. You have to deal with them. Edna does, Sonia, uh, Sarita, and Lucy, and Amy, and Danielle. We all have to deal with them. And the way that we have a chance to manage it is to set priorities. Set and stay with it, number one. And as we're doing that setting is to try to keep our standards as high as possible. When our standards are as high as possible and we're setting the right priorities, we'll move those distractions back. So as we're trying to get a new business going and do new and different things, that means we're going to have to be doing different things tomorrow than what we're doing today. And some things are going to have to be moved back to make room for these business items we got to do. Now, some of our distractions, we can't, we can't deal, we can't change. 
It might be the children in our life that we have to look after or play taxi for. Uh, we may be a primary caregiver for a parent or a relative, and that's a 36-hour day job. I've done it myself for five different seniors. It may be someone that just bugs you to death and will not leave you alone or let you stay focused on something. <laughs> it might be a bulldog like Otis over here who can't stand for me to be talking. If he's, if he's not asleep, he's going to be barking. So he's a distraction. Love him, but still he's a distraction. We have to learn to deal with that. Uh, how, do, how do we do that? We, we have to uh, strive to be conscious to, to, to uh, look for the items that are actually in rivalry with us for our time. Now, something that helps me, and I've done it for now for four or five years, is every morning when I wake up, before I get out of bed, when, when you're laying there and you can't get up yet, I'll try to think of three things that I must get done before lunch. Three things that are really important for my business. Call a certain person, call three or four people, pay a bill, uh, close a deal, make sure I spend time uh, making money and just not spend time working. And I'll get those in my head and then I'll start my morning now and I'll fight the distractions all that I can until I get those three things done. And it works. Sometimes I may not eat lunch to three o'clock because I make a promise to myself to try to get that done. Now, a lot of y'all privately have sent me some notes saying it really works for you too. And so I suggest that you do it. Other things that will help you fight the distractions are those 40 drill skills. There's some, there's some uh, strategies in there that will help you with that as well. So we need a competitive advantage. And oftentimes what we say is, well, if we don't have a competitive advantage, that means we need a cheaper price. No, you're not going to find your competitive advantage with a cheaper price. It may be an ingredient that has to do with your competitive advantage, and it's going to be the price, but it does not have to be the cheapest price for you to have a competitive advantage. Let's talk about that a little bit. What can make the difference for you? Well, first of all, you want your presentations, the way you're presenting your pricing, like that advertised sale price, the way you're presenting your merchandise, which is, uh, which is merchandising skills. And I can send you a real good study guide on merchandising. And we may even have some merchandising uh, uh, webinars in the future. But that is very, very important with the presentation, that salad bar approach. But making your presentation a work of art, that's the paperwork. If you're selling time for money, that's the way you talk about and you present your schedule or you do your contracts. Uh, if you're uh, merchandising products, it's the different strategies that you use that we've talked about in pricing. Uh, using different pricing strategies can make a, a, a world of difference. Uh, competition Sometimes they break, and I don't want to say that it's not. It's, sometimes it's not in games, it's all internet and trading back and forth. But sometimes you get right down to the degree. Uh, not, you get to fight like these uh, deer are doing. So when you're trading blows, you're making, you're making uh, offers, and then just bloody, you get right down to your bottom line. You want the deal, but sometimes uh, you feel like you're forced to sell items for a lower price than you need to just so you can win advantage of this customer. And I understand that, and I do it. Because I know from the items that I sell, if I can sell them a piece of equipment, someday they'll need a part. So oftentimes you have to trade off the advantage of, 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 of taking a deal for a little less money than you wanted to for what the future advantages are. And that works if you've got a good marketing plan. If you've got a marketing plan that's, that's, that's putting you in touch with them and you're getting feedback in the future from them and additional business in the future, I consider that seed money. 
Yep, you're just getting started. You'll you'll sell something for a lower lower price to so have a chance to make this a raving fan customer that will help the long term price of your business. That's a reality check. You know, I, I I want to be the best coach I can be for you. I want to tell you always to make that extra money. I never sell down this your calls, but always hold your ground and say take it or leave it. Bull. This is the real world, and I'd rather have a penny than a nothing. But I'm not going to take that penny without making an investment in that customer to try to keep them coming back so that eventually they're going to be a good customer and I'll be able to stay in business with them for a long time. Yeah, there's always a reality check that we can make when we're doing this. Happy customers. Customers that leave our environment and go out and talk to other customers about they enjoy doing business with us, they got a fair shake, they'll come back. That's the customer we want to make because it's that long-term strategy that works for us. Let's be realistic. You need to find low-hanging fruit. You need to find the customers that you can do business with in a hurry for the least amount of money and somebody that's close by to get your business jump-started that kickstarts your business. Uh, your business can't be all things to all people, but it must be everything to some people. And those some people will become your raving fan and very loyal customers. So keep that in mind. Are you looking for the customers that's closest to you? Understand what branding is. Understand that you'll be able to get more money, for, you'll be able to price better if people feel like they're buying something that's unique. It's got a brand name, a, a slogan attached to it, something they feel like is going to be around a long time. That will enhance your pricing. Know that, that value-added benefits help you make more money for the same product than someone else is selling. Value-added are the little extra things that you do for things, and customers will pay you more for it and help your price in doing that. Now, another reality check is brands. There are some customers out there that you don't want. There are some real buttonholes in this world that that you can't satisfy. And here at 76 years old, I can tell you I've seen my share of them. And I do everything I can to create a Raven fan customer. But I also know that if you go out here and you try to get all the business, you're going to get all the bad business too. So that comes all the way back full circle for you stead at setting those standards and fighting the distractions. And sometimes the distraction may be a customer that will never let you make a profit and bug you to death and you'll never be able to satisfy them. Well, I want you to be nice to them. And sometimes you just need to say, look, let's be friends, but why don't you go, biz why don't you go biz do your business down the street? I think we'll be better friends if you're doing business down there. Ah! Send them to the competitor. Let them wear them out. <clears throat> There's one great beauty in being an entrepreneur and owning your own business, and that is you can manage some things and you don't have to take some uh, stuff off other people. So keep your standards high and be willing to stand up for yourself. That's really important. As old Kenny Rogers sings it, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them and move on to where there is some profit to be made. Know your competition, top to bottom, understand what they're doing. They are important, but they got weaknesses, and you can study them, study their marketing and their websites, figure out what they're doing wrong, and, 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 uh, and capitalize on it. Fill out, figure out what they're doing right, and see if you can do it right, more right, or better. We need to outwork them. Out brand them, out thank them. We need to understand guerrilla marketing better than they do, and value added is our secret weapon. Then you can outlast them. But you know what? Why don't you stay friends with them? Stay friends with your competition. Because they're going to have some items they sell <clears throat> that you don't. But they're right next door to you. So if you have a customer that you can have go do business with them, and keep them close by, then you don't have a better chance for that customer to come back to see you. Or maybe you sell some items that they don't sell and vice versa, and y'all refer customers back and forth. 
for years and years, my business cargo equipment was located right beside the John Deere dealership here in Dunn. I sold Kubotas in New Hollands, and John Deere, of course, sold John Deere. But the dealership over there, they didn't focus on little tractors or middle-sized tractors. They were all about the great big harvesters and, and, and large several hundred horsepower tractors and 12 row planters and things like that. For my business, we focused on smaller tractors and recreational vehicles and forklifts. I really wasn't in competition with them from that standpoint. And we used each other to really bring a lot of customers and business to our town. Uh, because some of his customers needed small tractors, and some of my customers needed big stuff. And having a good working relationship with, our, with, with competition sometimes is a very smart thing to do. I want you to remember, it's not always about pricing, but good business creates good business. And competitors, <clears throat> good competitors that are right next door to each other, that's a good business move. Think about in your community when a, uh, a new, let's say a new uh, uh, pharmacy comes to town, a new drugstore. <clears throat> that CVS comes to town, they want to build right across the street from the Walgreens, right? It's amazing that one uh, really good uh, fast food place <clears throat> wants to be right across the street from another one. Good business creates business. So don't be afraid of your competition because your competition is bringing people to their store. And if you're a good competitor, some of that business will come your way as well. If you get all the business out there, there's a good chance you're going to get all the bad business. And as my daddy used to say, Steve, if you're out there setting the woods on fire, that is you're, you're cutting your prices down, you're trying to get all the business, set the woods on fire, then yours is going to be the first tail that gets burned. And that was good advice. So be careful. If you're trying to be the cheapest person in town, then you don't get that little segment of the market of people who are no buy as cheap as they can buy, whether you make a penny or not. Now, I'm not talking negatives here. I am talking reality. So the best way sometimes to get a group or a type of customers that will let you make a little bit of money is not to be too cheap. Because those, those people recognize that and came to you right away. Stay on your toes. Things are changing big time. It's inflationary times. Uh, I am happy to say, though, that while I've seen things go up so much in the last three years, incredibly, today I had one of my suppliers tell me that uh, freight cost on overseas shipments coming in had dropped by two-thirds in the last several uh, months. I don't know why, because I thought fuel prices kept going up. But things change. And by God, if he had passed that savings on to me, and I can pass it right on to our customers and reduce that advertised sale price, uh, I'll make more money, and I'll sell more stuff. So stay on top of your game, and always look for more opportunities, uh, more things that you can sell, uh, more uh, customer groups that you can serve. Fight the distractions. Set your priorities, maintain the standards, standards, and be the best person that you can be, and I'll guarantee you things will start improving. Now, please write down my email address, stvcarv at aol.com. aol.com, been around a long time. Uh, ask me about any questions you have or free study guides, uh, counseling sessions that you would like with your small business center or, or whatever. I'll be glad to uh, I'll answer any questions that you send as best as I can. Know that you're not here by yourself. Uh, you're trying to start your business. You maybe feel like you're you're all alone and doing this, and and it gets, it's a lonely thing when you don't have somebody to work with. Uh, you you don't have to be that way. Right here at the uh, Academy of Officers and Associates, yeah, it's a web website type thing. It's an internet thing. But a lot of you guys already know each other. You've been in uh, these uh, seminars now for a couple of years, back and forth. We get a lot of repeat stuff. I try to change them every day. And I feel like every session there's new things to learn that I pick up from y'all, and hopefully I can bring some new messages for you. So believe with all your mind, 
well, excuse me, imagine with all your mind, believe with all your heart, and let's achieve as much as you can do. I, I want to say to you, it is a pleasure to work for you and with you. And I want to see your businesses grow, and I want those reports. Every week, someone from the academy will send me a note about something good that's happened, uh, and that makes me feel good, so good. That's, that's why I do this, and it's, it's really good to, to work with you. So uh, I'm going to turn off the uh, screen sharing here. Stop screen sharing. And invite any of you to turn your mics on that you would like to, and uh, I'd like to hear from you, and we'll answer any questions we can, and go. So I've muted on my end. And uh, anyone have any comments? There's Amanda. Amanda, what you know tonight? And John, did you have a comment? I see you have the hands up there. Just a couple quick questions. Yeah. Uh, first of all, well, first of all, thank you for this series of classes. It's been great. Um, the classes you mentioned um, at the beginning of the session are those going to be online or in person? Everything is online. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you could uh, email me like that list, I'd like to look into trying to uh, sign up. I mean, how would I sign up for some of those? Well, when I send you the email, I'll give you the uh, the the, uh, the sign up information with the different uh, small business centers. Awesome, because I want to do some more of these. The other thing is you mentioned during the session about info on merchandising. That's going to be a major source of income for my business. Could you send me that material as well? And what was the topic again? Merchandising. Oh, yes, indeed. I'll send that to everyone that, uh, that gives me their email address. Okay. Uh, you yes. should already have my email address. I do. I do, John. Perfect. Well, thanks again so much for this series of classes, Steve. It's been very valuable. Thank you so much. Okay, and who is unknown? I've got an unknown up here. Who am I talking to there? Turn your mic on and let me know who you are so I know who I'm talking with. Unknown is what you got on your name. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? Amanda, good to have you back on board. Sonia as well. Hey, good night, Steve. Great class. Thank you, Sarita. We'll be getting that uh, list of certificates we need to mail out to all these wonderful folks. Uh, I'll send them to you in a day or two, okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Any other comments? Man, I have a comment. I... Okay, <laughs> Sonia. Yes. Um, I want to my, – my goal is to become a general contractor, GC. And okay. I've, just, I've just started. Um, I'm doing a lot of residential work right now. But Good for you. My, yeah, my friend is allowing me to actually work on her home. I'm going to do the rebuild on her home. Uh huh. And but and, uh, go ahead. And what what region are you working in? The University, Charlotte, North Carolina. The okay. University. Yes. All right. And I want and, to know. What, Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Have you taken any classes to get your contractor's license? Well, I want to go to uh, CPCC. Uh huh. They have an in class. I was just going to order the books online, but I think being an instructional class, just a setting, will be good. What do you think? I'm good at tests anyway, but I know it's a series of books we need to take in there, like updated books. And... Well, it's certainly it's. it's a... General contracting license is a challenge. It is a very difficult uh, uh, test to pass. Uh, and it's expensive studying, so uh, get ready for. Uh, I don't. I want, don't want to say a, a rough road, but there's going to be. There's always going to be some bumps in that road. So just just prepare yourself uh, to have to do a lot of studying and a lot of learning. But I really congratulate you for being willing to take the challenge and go for it. Well, I'm going to go with the residential first and then jump with the general contracting. I understand. That's great. Uh, if you find someone to work with that already has a license that you can get some apprenticeship, that might be a good thing to do. 
Okay, I've, I've been doing some of that, and um, they gave me a, a list of places to go and do an in class, sit in class, and and uh, so right. going to CPCC. They don't offer that where you're at, right? I think pretty much. Uh, I'm sure there's some of the schools down here that do offer that. I'm uh, quite sure that uh, uh, the one in Wilmington, uh, Cape Fear, does for sure. But I'll tell you what, I'll look into it. I appreciate it, and I appreciate mm -hmm. your classes. They're so informative. I love well, great. it. I'm learning a lot more. I'm oh, thinking about doing other businesses because of you. So you give me better, more ideas. So I try to do that. And tomorrow afternoon, I'll give you a lot of ideas if you can join us from four to six. I will be there. I definitely will be there. All right, then that'll be a, a, a Zoom class. So uh, I get I sent in the email today uh, how to log into it. But I'll do it again tomorrow. I will be there everywhere you are. I'm going to be. All right. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a comment? There's a known. Who is that? Who's online here? Unknown? Okay, I can't hear you. My, your microphone may not be working. I had a question if you can hear me. I hear you, Maddie Joy Boutique. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is it okay to walk away from a bad sale? Because I had a customer, and it's been keeping me up at night because they ordered something from me, and I fulfilled the order cheaper than I should have because they were being difficult. And then they come back, and they were like, oh, I want four or five more of those for that price. And I went back, and the stuff had gone up, and I can't sell it for that price. And then they don't want to use the website. They said they don't trust my website. They don't want me to mail it or ship it. And they want me to actually hand deliver it. And they live over two hours away. That is absolutely ridiculous. And you just call it like it is. Uh, being in business uh, uh, means that you have to stand up for yourself and not let people take advantage of you. But at the same time, re remember that if someone is doing business the right way, you want them. Uh, but it's perfectly okay and acceptable for you to say to someone, you know, this just isn't working out. You might you might try to find another supplier. If, if you get the sense they're just taking advantage of you, uh, and there are some people that are professionals at that, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take advantage of especially new entrepreneurs, so you, you have to be careful. So... Not only would I say, is it okay to walk away from that? You run like hell. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, all right. <clears throat> Good Can luck you, with that. Can you post your email again also so that I have it in case I needed to contact again with any questions? Uh, can you see the chat board? Um, yes. All right. I'll do it again in chat here. Well, I'm trying to figure out a way to do it. Let me tell you very slowly, okay? STV. Okay, hold on. Let me get a pen. I didn't have a pen. I'm I sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, I need it, to get that pen really quick. Well, uh, Maddie, I'll email it to you also. Okay, I'm ready. STV, like Steve Tom Victory, C A R V, at AOL.com. Okay, thank you so much. You too. Look forward to working for you. Hey, da hey there, Danielle. How are you? <laughs> I see your video. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, I, I, I realized. <laughs> uh, quick question. Um, do you have a class for, like, young adults? For young, 
um, my kids are they want to do the lemonade day thing, the lemonade stand, and we before, but with your entrepreneur class, I was just thinking, I was like, oh, some of these kids will probably like to do that. Um, you know, that's kind of cool. Like a young adult. Especially during the summertime. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great idea. Let, yeah, me, give that some, let me give that some thought. Uh, the uh, small business centers might not sponsor it, but I might do that on my own through the academy. I appreciate the opportunity. I'll give that some thought. Yeah, I was thinking. Help me come up with some topics. <laughs> yeah, Will you my... Help me come up with some topics Car for one for, yeah, for one for one hour classes. We might give it a try during yeah, the summer. Some of these yeah. Thank well thank thanks for the idea. All right, well thank you all for hanging with us. Amanda, you take care, and Edna, and John, and Amy, uh, Sonia, and uh, Tisha. I hope you all have a great week. And if you can, join us tomorrow, okay? Bye-bye, everybody. Love you. Bye.